because when we disenfranchise people that have, I mean, in some states, we still disenfranchise people who have paid their debt to society and have clean records. There are just still two states where if you committed a felony at any point in your life, you can never vote again. And for me, that always had a really harsh impact because I see us as first communal beings. We are part of a society. And when you have laws like that, it says you are not part of us anymore. And what kind of impact does that have? What other lifestyle works for you other than this lifestyle of perpetually seeking escape? That was Jeannie Harrison of Grow Huntington, and this is the Yogi Triathlete Podcast. Hey, everyone. How's it going? I'm psyched you're back for another episode of the YTP. I'm your host, Jess, and this is the place to stop by every week to listen in on the stories of people looking, finding, and living their purpose. We bring you athletes, doctors, health and wellness crusaders, yogis, authors, plant power advocates, and sometimes they're a combo of all that good stuff. And today we bring you a woman who has looked and found and is now living her purpose by bringing her vision of Grow Huntington to life. Initially inspired by a documentary screening of Urban Roots some years ago, it wasn't until the early months of 2016 that the vision came in clear. While sitting in her car waiting to meet a friend for dinner, Jeannie scrolled through job boards in the nonprofit sector. Most, if not all, would pull her out of Huntington, the city she fell in love with during college. It was during this routine job search that Jeannie experienced a subtle but powerful moment of possibility and the seeds that eventually would become Grow were planted. Grow is a nonprofit urban farm in the heart of Huntington, West Virginia, with a primary focus on serving those in addiction recovery. Through providing coping, life, and job skills to underserved populations, Jeannie believes the entire city of Huntington will benefit and be revitalized. She plans to work with Marshall University's School of Medicine to conduct studies showing the efficacy of this type of healing, and in a good-for-all mindset, GROW is documenting everything they do in hopes to provide a skeleton program that may be duplicated by other communities and cities around the country. This January, less than a year from that night outside the restaurant, GROW is set to launch their 200-hour pilot program, Beginnings. Working with the earth and cultivating the crops is just one of the ways that GROW is giving back to the participants. The beginnings program also includes job skills training and education on navigating the harsh stigma of addiction recovery and the rebuilding of social capital. Jeannie is a willful soul who came into the world ready to be a game changer, coming to her dad in a dream and telling him it was time for her to be born was clear insight into the determined and unstoppable being that Jeannie is today. And Huntington needs her, a town that suffers in the face of ill health, an overdose rate three times the national average, and high levels of poverty. Jeannie Harrison is nothing less than an angel in street clothes, and we are so glad to know her. Check out the show notes to find more about Grow and all the awesome deals that you guys get from our sponsors just for listening to the show. Thanks so much for tuning in, and we hope you enjoy our conversation with Jeannie Harrison of Grow Huntington. Nice All right. It's always an arrangement. The threesome <laughs> podcast is always an arrangement. Yeah, so you were listening to my conversation with Philip this morning. Yes, yes. He, really incredible. And I think I described it in, in the podcast, but uh, I had known for a long time that I was going to be a yoga teacher, and I walked into his class on my birthday. I think oh I was God. turning 39 years old. And from the moment that he opened his mouth, I knew, like, this is it. Like, this is my teacher. Because the way he spoke was, um, was like how a normal person would speak. And he said his humor was really spontaneous. And the class was never about him, although he drew so much from his experience that the teachings just, they were so relevant and potent and applicable, like immediately. And I think that's what's so key is when you find your teacher, you know, like, oh my gosh, I am, that's my person. Like I get, you know, like, and as a yoga teacher, you're going to find 
that your students are going to find you. And at first, people are going to come to your class and they might not be your students and they might not come back. But that's okay because your students are waiting for you. Right. Yeah. And I've really been thinking about that a lot lately, (laughs) that concept of like your authentic voice and the role that it plays versus appealing to your audience. And what I've found in, so I'm a a marketing and PR consultant. That's my my full-time thing um, as I transition into grow. But what I always tell my clients is be as authentic as possible and your audience will find you. You know, like if you don't have to prove anything to anybody, you just have to be completely 100% yourself and people will flock to that because people love authenticity because it opens them up to be able to be authentic themselves, right? And that's that's what's it's really powerful. And once you can tap into that and be comfortable with it, because we're all a little screwed up, right? <laughs> like, oh my god, totally, <laughs> totally screwed up. Um, in a really, and I say that in a really loving sense. I recall a point in my life where I was married um, to this guy right here. I've mm-hmm. only been married once, so I was married to him, still am. And I. I I was at my house in Boulder, Colorado, where we were living, and I was in massage school, and there was a lot of, like, checking in in massage school. Like, the first 45 minutes of class was people really opening up about what was going on in their life, and my check-in was always like, I'm fine, I'm fine. And I remember a point during that time where I thought to myself, it's so embarrassing to admit these things, but I think they're, they're, they're real and they're true to me. I, I remember thinking, not a, more on, on more than one occasion, I'm so glad I have nothing to work on. Oh, God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm so glad I'm delusional. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so glad I have nothing to work on. Yeah. And I look back now at that girl, and, and she was successful, and she was well-liked, and she was funny, and I was functioning in the world, you know, but I had tons of highs and lows, and my heart was so hardened. It was so closed. Yeah. And I thought that that opening of your heart and the stories that I heard in the check-ins during massage school were weakness. And I realize now that, you know, stepping into yourself truly is It's the most powerful place you can be, not only for yourself, but for your role in this world. And to be more of ourselves is everything that the world needs. Yeah, it's so funny. Like, this is the synchronicity working because the theme that I have been seeing throughout my teacher training and my yoga practice, just my personal practice, is that opening is strengthening. And that's been the theme as I develop my classes, that has been that continuing theme. And because I'll be teaching yoga with the people that I interact with at Grow, I think that that's going to be a really key lesson that we learn and teach is, you know, you're not going to find strength in making yourself stone. You're going to find strength in being that open, dynamic, moving being, right? That is so beautiful. I love that. And I was stoned for a long time, although there was this softness inside that I was attuned to at a very young age. I just didn't know what to do with it. Yeah. Well, I actually saw a naturalist a few um, a few months ago, and she said, the key is to be solid and stone on the inside and to be soft on the outside. Mm. Like, be so comfortable with who you are and know that you are this complete being and to be fully just solid in that state. But on the outside, you are mush. And she equated a lot of that to the divine feminine. We were really working on cultivating the divine feminine presence and that emotional side and that intuitive side. And she said, on the outside, you are just so soft and receptive but on the inside, you are that solid foundation for yourself. And that's so powerful. Yeah. I like that analogy. It's, 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 almost, it's almost like you're opening yourself outside. Um, during, sounds like from your teacher training, like you're going to be vulnerable. Yeah. So now you're going to be able to accept criticisms and be okay with it. And that's something that we've been, we've been talking about lately with some guests is, is being okay with people not liking you or not, or walking out of your yoga session and, and being okay with that. But that's, truly being your authentic self and really accepting who you are and that and that these people will come because they will there's there's no doubt about it but it's that faith that belief in the unseen that really captures you and and keeps you moving forward so um 
I'm so excited to see that you're doing this teacher training. You're, yeah. you're, form, you're growing grow. So what is grow? Yeah. So it's funny. We talk about like you know, being your authentic self. And what I find so interesting is that Huntington is such a weird place and that my weirdness fits with Huntington. <laughs> so, <laughs> and that's, I mean, it's a great transition in this conversation. Um, so grow is truly, I was, I was in the car driving here this morning And I thought to myself, like, how do I describe grow? And there have been a number of times when people say, like, well, well, who is like in like who is in this? Who is your board of directors? Who are your volunteers? You know, who's the who are the stakeholders in this? And yeah, I mean, we have a board of directors and we're building our volunteer base and everything. But I just I just look at people and go, grow is me. Like grow is just me. And it is my manifestation of my love of Huntington and what I want to do and bring to this place. So yeah, I mean, it it all comes back to that, to that being your authentic self. So I grew up um, just uh, about 30 miles outside of Huntington to a very typical like West Virginia family. I wouldn't say we were super typical. Like when you think of West Virginia, I think that a lot of people go to the stereotypes of, you know, barefoot and pregnant back in a holler, right? We weren't necessarily that, but, you know, my, my mother was a nationally ranked rifleman. Like my family loves shooting and hunting and fishing and those types of things. Um, and I never really related to that kind of stuff. I would always, my mother would go fishing and I would take a book, you know, I was the weirdo in my family. Um, and it started from like conception because my father told me that they didn't want another kid. It was just my, my parents and my brother. And he said, you came to me in a dream and said, I'm ready to be born, basically. And I was like, ah, that sounds like me. (laughs) Like, hey, I'm ready. I know it's been eight and a half years and you don't want another kid, but I'm ready. And he was like, okay. So it's it's funny. Um, I, I was always the weirdo in my family. First generation college student went off to grad school in DC and was just this idealistic kid who was like, I'm going to change the world. And then DC just like sucked that out of me so fast. I was going to say how <laughs> DC is a pretty intense place. It like, is incredibly we're intense. We're from the, um, from New England and that's a pretty intense place. And we just spent time in Alexandria and it felt very similar yes. um, energetically. Like I can really, I can feel those similarities, very dense, um, mm-hmm. a lot of moving parts, uh, a lot of stress. Yes. A lot of, I mean, especially the political capital of our nation, literally, how did that, how did that go? I mean, I think you kind of summed it up, but let's, how was that walking into that? So I went to Georgetown for my master's in American government because I was going to be this nonprofit rock star, right? Um, My nickname at Georgetown was Folksy. Uh, so, and I hated that nickname. I hated it because they didn't really associate it. Cause I was, you know, people from all over the country and they didn't understand like what it was like to be from West Virginia. And they, when they called me folksy, it was sort of a term of endearment for them, but I saw it as really condescending because yeah, I mean, there are parts of me that are always going to be a West Virginia girl. And you know, I was, I, and I, I was sort of at that point in my life, really embracing a lot of that too, because as I was was living in DC and going through this really stressful time, I was missing the mountains. I mean, it's there's a very special dynamic between an Appalachian and the mountains. So I lived, after I graduated from undergrad, I lived briefly in Lafayette, Indiana, and I felt naked all the time. I mean, it was naked and vulnerable all the time. And, uh, you know, the way the storms would roll over the, the plains, it was... It was scary for me. Like, I was always on high alert. And I had really, you know, living in that place and being in that really high stress situation really started missing the hug of the mountains and that closeness. Um, but, uh, you know, they would call me folksy. And I was like, you guys, that that comes off as really condescending. Oh, my right? God. I can, to- I can totally see myself being that person calling you folksy and being like, like loving you genuinely, but kind of like dismissing the fact that it hurt your feelings, right? right? Because (laughs) you're so, you can be pretty hardened Mm -hmm. living in that area, right? Like hardened in a way, not, I'm not saying these people are all 
nasty. I'm just saying they're um, hardened in a way where you don't realize that what can bounce off of you doesn't bounce so quickly off of somebody else. Right. Well, that's the thing. And and I saw this a lot. I was I think I was a little bit more prepared for it because I had been in the nonprofit sector for years and I had kind of gotten past this part of it. But especially when I would work with young interns that were you know still in college, still like 18, 19 years old, they would come to me and they would say, I didn't expect working in the nonprofit sector to be so like dog eat dog and competitive. Like I came here to to, like make the world a better place. And I was like, guys, you know, ego is in everything. And just because you're not really competing and sometimes you are competing for financial capital doesn't mean that you're not competing for political capital and social capital and these things. So yeah, like they, they were really pulling that out of me and making me aware of that as well. Making, and I had forgotten, you know, what the purpose truly was of why I was in the sector and and why I had chosen that lifestyle. So yeah, so after grad school, I, I did a year in a DC nonprofit. And I'm glad I did. But ultimately, it really divorced me from my true identity and, and my purpose. Uh, so my husband at the time was uh, going to grad school in Denver. So we had these plans. And it was like April, and he was going to grad school in August. And I said, can we please just go home for three months? Can can we just go home and be in West Virginia and like watch my nieces grow up and just just leave DC behind? Can we just get out of here? And he said, okay, let's do that. So we came home and it was supposed to be for three months. I love the plan, by the way. Right. The plan is always so great. We're going to do this for exactly 12 weeks and then we're going to do this. So what happened? God laughed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, as they, as they usually. Laughing at us yeah, the, every day. Oh, the divine schedule maker, <laughs> yes. as I called it. Yeah, it's, it's a joke. Yes, it is. Well, it's strange because I, my now ex-husband, um, but just a spoiler alert, but, <laughs> <laughs> but he is my best friend and I just the most like, important person that I have ever encountered in my life. And the ex absolutely in that title means absolutely nothing. Like he is the most important person uh, in my life. But there was always this sense, this intuitive sense that I I wasn't supposed to be married to him. And I know now that because he really hindered my spiritual journey and he recognizes that and acknowledges it. It's a personality difference. He has, it, it was never anything he did intentionally, but it was just this knowing that he didn't relate to that aspect of me hindered me a lot. So that really started getting louder when we were back home and we were looking at housing prices in Denver and oh my God, like I, you know, and as a farmer, I'm going, there's so much fertile soil at the bottom of those mountains and people are building apartment complexes on them and it was killing me. (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, I'm looking at apartments and we're doing this and this, this sense of dread is just settling in. And I looked at him and I said, Josh, I can't go. I can't do it. And I mean, he had like three weeks to get to Denver. Like it was very short notice. But he is the one person in my life that if I said, I need to go backpacking through Alaska for the next two years and be a hermit in a cave or whatever, he would be, okay, Mm -hmm. go for it. You know, just always. Okay. And I heard that I I have a sense that you guys have that same dynamic. Oh, very much. (laughs) Like, hey, this awesome opportunity has come up. And it's like, but you're not going. It's just me. And I'm leaving tomorrow. <laughs> and I mean, and here's a new puppy. So take love care. Love you, of bye. <laughs> yeah, to have that partner, whether it's your, it, it doesn't matter the label that you put mm-hmm. on it. It sounds like Josh is still somebody in your yeah. life that gives you that space, that gives you the permission to take that space. And yeah. it's so important, especially if you're a spiritual seeker. Yeah. For yeah. sure. Yeah. So, so I thought, okay. What do I need to do to find why I'm supposed to stay in West Virginia? I, I had this sense that, well, gosh, what if like my mother gets sick and she needs somebody to take care of her? I had no idea. All I knew was that my future was in West Virginia. So, okay, listen to it, see what happens. So I started looking at, you know, jobs in places that I thought might fit my personality. I thought, okay, I'll scroll through job boards in 
Austin, Texas or Seattle or Portland. Like, okay, I'm weird. I'm crunchy. Let's do this. So it was about six months of trying to establish like what the future was. Did I need to be more independent? Like, did I need to know what it was like to live on my own? I'd only lived on my own for like six months out of my entire adult life um, because I got married very young. So I was really trying to figure out like what that path was going to be. And what I kept realizing was I kept doing these things that I thought other people thought I needed to be doing. Mm. And the only difference was the voice changed, right? So, you know, growing up and like you, you get really good grades and you participate in high school and you, you check all those boxes because your parents tell you to. And then you go to college and then I went to, to grad school and I'm like, okay, this is the path I want. But that, you know, the voice wasn't my parents anymore. It was some kind of nebulous thing, this, this sense of what I'm supposed to be. So, but I'd always had this concept that, you know, once I've done that and checked those boxes and had the career and the 401k and <laughs> all the things. Oh my gosh. Totally. I know. I <laughs> feel your pain. Right? Like once I've proven myself which I knew it was never going to be like a normal career. Like I knew there was going to be something funky about it. And, you know, I thought just like, oh, you know, I'll be running a nonprofit somewhere, like not a big deal. Um, but, you know, I was never going to end up in a bank somewhere, <laughs> you know. But I thought, you know, I'm going to go off somewhere, check the boxes. And then, you know, I'll come home to Huntington because Huntington is where I went to undergrad. It was the only place that really ever felt like home. Like I never really truly felt at home growing up like I liked where I was but when I came to Huntington in undergrad I was like wow like it was this sense of place I'd never experienced before and I would wake up every morning and this is so dorky and just gives you a sense of how dorky I am um but are you familiar with Hairspray and the the song Good Morning Baltimore Yes, yes. Oh, my God. I would wake up in the morning and be like, good morning, Huntington. I mean, seriously. And it was awful. Like, I was, like, such a dweeb about it. But I did. I just loved Huntington so much. I love that. I love that. Yeah. Mm. So, so I, you know, I had told my, my husband, I was like, you know, someday, like, when I'm, like, 55, 60, I will come back and I'll, like, I don't know, run for mayor of Huntington or something. And I saw myself staying, you know, settling here in after I had proven myself elsewhere, right? And, and there was also a sense of, like, when I'm worthy of it. Like, oh, you know, I'll go somewhere else and earn my keep and learn, all, learn everything I need to learn. That was the imposter syndrome, right? Like, I mm -hmm. can't really serve my city until... Yeah, but who I've puts those constraints? Who who is that for? Like, right. who ever created that that yeah. you had to do A, B, and C in order to do that? Right. Yeah. So, um, so on February twenty second, I will never forget this day. I actually went on a date a few weeks ago, and the guy was like, "That's my birthday," and I was like, oh, "That's so weird." <laughs> That's weird. That ended up not working out. So it was not this weird <laughs> synchronicity. It was just a coincidence. <laughs> but on February twenty second, I was sitting um, in the parking lot waiting for my friend to arrive. Um, we were going out to dinner, and I was scrolling through job boards. You know, marketing coordinator for Habitat for Humanity in Portland, Oregon. Right. And looking at these things, I'm like, yeah, I can do that. Yeah. That'd be cool. Okay, maybe I'll apply to that. And I sat back and I was like, you know what? Maybe. Just like maybe you don't have to go anywhere. Maybe you could find something here. And it wasn't this big moment. It wasn't this like huh ah, moment. It was just, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna broaden the horizon just a little bit and say, maybe you can stay here. And I'm sitting across from him at dinner like an hour later. And the only way I can describe it is just this, this moment of insight. And my astrologer calls it a text message from God when you get that like moment of intuitive, that intuitive oh, yeah. flash. Oh, yeah. Very familiar. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of how I ended up on this couch in a Holiday Inn in Huntington was <laughs> just listen, getting that text message. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. I love it. And I, I looked at my friend and I said... I'm going to start a nonprofit farm and I think I want to work with people in addiction recovery and maybe we'll start manufacturing essential oils because you know what? There's not a local manufacturer of essential oils. 
And and he goes, okay. <laughs> like, it, it almost seemed like it was kind of growing in that moment. Like, I'm going to do a nonprofit here. And then, like, it, the text, yes. another text. Yeah. And now I'm going to be working with... And that's how it just kind of layers in. Yeah. And when you're open to it, you don't have to find the words. You don't have to think of the idea. You don't have to, like, even have a plan. Because when it's coming in and flowing through you, there is a knowing. Yeah. That is unquestionable. And yes. do you feel like that's what you experienced that Absolutely. night? Absolutely. Yes. And what year was this? This was just this year. 2016, 2016. February 22nd. This was what, eight months ago? Mm -hmm. Yep, eight months ago. Yay. Yeah, and what's great is the universe is on your side. Like when you find <laughs> what you're supposed to be doing, the universe is on your side. And there, I mean, of course, there have been days where I'm like, oh my God, I must be crazy for doing this because I am like, doing this for free have been doing this for free for eight months my board is finally like we'd really like to start paying you and i'm like no 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 not yet <laughs> <laughs> we're not ready <laughs> but there has been there have been these really amazing moments of just synchronicity and you know people finding us like you guys finding mm -hmm. like what did you find a flyer i found i think i found an oh i know what i found i found this article that was um, had a very negative tone to it. I believe it was this article, and it was like, you know, five years later, Huntington's still the same. And it talks about Jamie Oliver coming. But the thing was, the article wasn't negative at all. The article was really beautiful. And it was like the first uh, first paragraph was like, West Virginia is number two in the state for her to, in whatever, number two in the country. And, in, and I was like, I don't know what you normally like, but something told me to read on. And when I read on, it was all about how like the, the changes in the school system are still in place and that other schools are jumping on and people are bringing plant-based nutrition here and all of these things. And I believe it was in that article that I read about Grow Huntington. And, I, and at the same time where BJ was also finding somebody in town here that was doing something amazing. And I was like, I'm like, remember I said to him, he was reading me something because like, wait, he, wait, wait. he was so excited. <laughs> and I said, um, honey, I... I'm, I'm trying to read too. Like just, I mean like. Because I was reading out loud my article. Because you were so excited yeah. and I was like, oh my God, girl. literally like I told you, it stopped me. And I was like, girl, Huntington. And then it went from there. Then it went to the Facebook page. Then it went to the GoFundMe. And then I saw the video and I was like, and I'm like, I'm going to reach out to her. And I'm like, I've got her phone number. I'm just going to call her right now. Yes, and I called, yeah. I, I acted on that. And that's something that I've really started to, um, really, really putting into action is in that moment, I was like, call her. So I called you. It wasn't like, oh, I'm trying to prepare for this under other interview that we're doing today. It wasn't that. It was like, in that moment, I acted on it. In that moment, as that information was coming in at dinner that night, you were at, you were putting it into words. And when we start putting it into words, and especially when we start putting it into words in front of other people, it be gets a life. Yes, you it manifest gets a life. It, yeah. And so there was something really powerful about it that drew me in and, and we connected and, and you're here, right? And yeah. I was like, you know, can you do an interview <laughs> within the next like 18 hours? <laughs> but there was something that felt like it was going to happen. Yeah. And so, and here it is. Yes, and I'm so pleased that it did, yeah. And it's it's been really cool. You know, there are even small moments of synchronicity. Like, uh, I'm working with an extension agent to map out exactly what our farm's going to look like because we have land and we have about a quarter of an acre. And, uh, you know, we're at the end of the growing season, so we can't really do anything this year, but we're going to be building our raised beds and everything in November. So she and I go up and we're looking at this plot of land and it had been raining all day, all day long. It was awful. And I was like, I guess we're going to have to reschedule, but I just go down anyway. We both park our cars and the clouds part and the sun comes out. And I was like, that's the grow flow. Like, that's it. That's, that's what this is. And she just, yep, that's it. Like, it is amazing how much the universe has been on our side in this. And I just feel so fortunate because, you know, there are times when I'm like, oh my God, like, you know, coming off of like my, my, my partner and I have had a really awesome relationship, but we are getting a divorce and like dealing with all of that side of it and really trying to reevaluate like what I am in the world. But I'm like, wow, I have this one thing that is just solid. Like I know what I'm supposed to be doing with my life. And I feel so crazy fortunate that I have that one thing. Like if everything else is chaos, which it probably will be because it's me, like 
I still, at the end of the day, I know I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. Like that is so incredible to me and I'm so fortunate for it. Um, but yeah, we, we should actually probably talk about uh, like what exactly we're doing with Grow. Yeah, let's, <laughs> let's talk about it. Um, what are you doing with Grow? I mean, yeah, I've got some other questions for you, but I want to, uh, I want to dive into it. Sure. What are you, what are you doing and, um, what is it about the addiction recovery that came through? Did you have personal experience with that through friends, family, yourself? What, what is it that pulled that in? Yeah, so addiction has been a what I would call a low grade theme in my life um, for a very long time, but never something that was super catastrophic. So that it wasn't like I had a parent who was dealing with addiction, and I certainly have an addictive personality, uh, but it hasn't really ruined my life yet. And I have so sometimes people in the addiction world would be like, "So are you recovering?" Like you know, and I don't know if it's looking for cred or if it's <laughs> like just trying to find common ground. I think it's more trying to find common ground. Um, but I'm like, no, I'm not recovering. I just I really care about this. <laughs> so, um, but that's not to say that. Well, first of all, I think we're, I think we're all addicts to some degree. And I think that we're all in recovery from being a human being. Right. But this may have been something that you carried in from another life. Yes, yeah, sir. Probably very much so, if not definitely. Right, right. That you struggled with this at some point. There's These things that we're passionate about are not by chance. Yeah, yeah. It's not just, just random. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, so, um, so I started my work in prevention, actually, um, when I was – transitioning from eighth grade to ninth grade, my grandfather passed away of lung cancer and he had smoked his whole life. And I am this like 14 year old kid. And I walk up to his, his house. I'm standing at his front door and there's this sign on the door that says oxygen tank and use no smoking. Right. Super common little sign that we see, but I had never really, I was 14. I'd never, you know, experienced this before. So I go in and I, I peek around the corner to see him laying in his bed and he's hooked up to this oxygen machine. And he has this pack of cigarettes by, by his nightstand. And he kind of just looks at me and, and looks down and pulls off the oxygen mask. And he lights up a cigarette and starts smoking. And first I'm like, oh my God, like, is the house going to oh, explode? Right. Yeah. You know, I'm freaking out. <laughs> but, there's that. <laughs> yeah, there's, there's that immediate yeah. danger. That did not happen. Thank God. Um, but... That was the first time I really saw what addiction did. Like, he was so addicted. That's, that's really intense. Yeah. And he's on his deathbed. And there is no turning back from this now. And that was this really powerful moment. And I came across SAD, which is Students Against Destructive Decisions, very shortly after that. And uh, throughout high school, I was the SAD kid. The SAD kid. And <laughs> okay, I can totally relate. Oh my god, it sounds like you're like the female incarnation of right. BJ. You used to do this I too. Used to do, go talk in high schools. Oh. I, in high school, I would go talk to the classes about not drinking and dri- I think we're drinking, drinking and driving then. Is it yeah, destructive it was, decisions now? Yes. Yeah, so in '97, okay. they changed it to okay. destructive decisions. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that makes oh, very sense. Cool. We're both sad kids. It's so cool. I know. Oh my god. I'm not, I'm not gonna even speak. To you. <laughs> I was in that audience. Yeah. <laughs> Listen to this guy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so it's a miracle I'm alive right now. Let's just, <laughs> let's just leave it at that. It's a miracle. You know, different paths, same, yeah. same result, mm-hmm. right? Um, so I got really into SAD. So I was on the National Council when I graduated high school. West Virginia SAD was just coming together uh, as a state organization. And I was on their first state leadership council and, you know, just as involved as humanly possible. Like there was no, there was no further extent I could be involved with that. I was just so into it. So (laughs) when I graduated high school, they hired me to run their program. Basically, they stuck me in the basement of City Hall with a $50,000 grant and said, do this thing. And I was like, oh, okay, I'm an 18-year-old with no job experience. Whoa, okay. But I managed to pull it off somehow. I don't know. (laughs) But uh, so I spent five years at West Virginia SAD, and we became, like, the number one uh, program in the country. Like, it was really crazy. Uh, Certainly not just my input at all. Uh, But we had the most amazing student and adult uh, advisory board and team. It was incredible. And... That's where I really got my footing as a nonprofit professional and really kind of realized what 
my demographic that I needed to serve was. Um, so I did my undergraduate thesis on felon disenfranchisement. And this has been a demographic for me that that always just resonated. My father was a prison guard for a while, and I would beg him to take me to work to, like, shadow him. And he was, he never let me do it, but I would beg him all the time, like, please let me go with you. I just want to talk to the guys. I just want to talk to the guys. I just want to understand a little bit better what their lives are like. Like, let me, let me do this. And he was always, no, why would you want to do that? Like, it was crazy. <laughs> it's not your typical bring your daughter to work day. No, it is certainly not. <laughs> and I'm sure, like, I don't even know if he could have if he had wanted to, but... I just, I, I just remember like throughout high school and, and undergrad, like, please, please take me to work with you, please. And I just, I really wanted to get, I really wanted to understand like what got them to that point, what social factors were at play, what psychological factors were at play. But I, and I always just had that craving and that understanding, but I never understood it. So when I started really conceptualizing of what GROW was going to be, I started talking to recovery houses here in Huntington and I, I hooked up with recovery point of West Virginia, which is an absolutely incredible, <coughs> incredible organization. Um, they, I can't even describe the amazing work they're doing. Um, but basically guys come in and, and live with them for six months while they kind of go through their recovery process. And I sat down and talked to three guys who work in the gardens at Recovery Point. And the reason felon disenfranchisement is important in this is because I, I, there was always this theme of citizenship involved as well. Because when we disenfranchise people that have, I mean, in some states we still disenfranchise people who have paid their debt to society and have clean records. There are just still two states where if you committed a felony at any point in your life, you can never vote again. And for me, that always had a really harsh impact because I see us as first communal beings. We are part of a society. And when you have laws like that, it says you are not part of us anymore. And what kind of impact does that have? What other lifestyle works for you other than this lifestyle of perpetually seeking escape? Uh, right? And it's, that's so limiting and so damaging and... If we can't be forgiven externally, how will we ever forgive ourselves? Right. How will we ever move forward? And BJ and I did a whole podcast on forgiveness, and it really got us to look deep into this. And one of the things I, I really came out of it was like, forgiveness is not about the past. It's about the future. Right. And it's about moving forward. And I was just reading in the Bhagavad Gita last night. Oh my gosh, so funny. We got the Bhagavad Gita out, of course. Um, right. <laughs> this is the Yogi Triathlete podcast. Um, and it was, it, oh gosh, I wish I, I think I had ticked the page. But anyway, it talks about you could be a murderer. You could be a thief. You could be the worst person in the world. But you can turn that all around. And in God's eyes, in the eyes of divine mother, of universe, of whatever you want to call it, higher intelligence, you are clear again. Right. Yeah. And so man puts these limitations on us. And, and yeah, this like castration from society, it's so, so damaging. Yeah. It's almost easier to do that than to start to work with them and be forgiving. Because right. that's where the real work starts. Right. To... to banish them in those two states there we are we're done with them like but that doesn't help the individual at all like it's kind of a dead end no totally and I'm, I'm even thinking about um okay so it's damaging to the individual and how can the individual forgive themselves but let's talk about the i mean let's not talk about because i want to continue with your story but <laughs> let's consider the people who are supporting this type of lawmaking and supporting this type of uh punishment like, what is, what are they seeing in the mirror? Right. You know, I mean, so it really, it all goes down to the fact that as individuals, we are suffering. And I believe that we're here to release ourselves from that suffering. And it takes a lot of work and it does take living in alignment and finding your purpose and all of that. The only way we can change any of this is through ourselves. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And when I realized that I hadn't and and what I learned from um, talking to the guys that had been working in the gardens at Recovery Point was that 
yeah, there's a therapeutic side to to nature, oh, right? Totally. And and a lot of our programming is based in nature assisted therapies. And sure, that's part of it. And watching something grow, some watching something that you have nurtured become something else is just an incredible experience. But what got everybody, what what silenced everybody in the room and gave me chills was when one of the guys said, "You know, that's all fair and good." But sometimes we have surplus food and I will take a bag of it to our neighbors down the street because they're in a residential neighborhood and Huntington is a very poor place. He said the most powerful thing for me is being able to take a bag of food to people who cannot afford fresh food. And I get, I have chills now talking about it. Right. And he looked at me and he said, I have taken my whole life. This is my opportunity to give back. And that reaffirmed for me in the moment that this had to happen. This program had to exist to give everybody who wants it that opportunity. And it's just incredible. And I think that, you know, as revolutionary and weird to academics and the medical community as nature assisted therapy is like it's really hard to get grant funding for nature assisted therapies because it's weird and it's not a pill that you can swallow right um but to say to them becoming part of society again and giving back like that's that's therapy too is even more crazy <laughs> so we need people who are going to be willing to fight for those types of things and and that's what I'm here to do and you're just you you're so there, it's the fear. It's the fear of the unknown. So they're they're not they don't understand that sort that type of therapy. And the more that you're breaking this barrier and bringing awareness to it, the more it's in the forefront of people's attention. So right. I applaud you for for just <laughs> being so dedicated to this. And you're only what eight months in, right? Eight months in. Um, but where do you see it going? So where sure. wh- where does this where does this go? Like yeah. So right now, this is what grow looks like. Uh, we are a staff of one, which is me, and uh, we have a half an acre, uh, a quarter of an acre usable lot of land in a residential neighborhood. And um, <clears throat> in November, we begin our first build. Uh, we will be welcoming in the community to build our raised beds and bring in all of our you know infrastructure and things. And we begin our first beginnings, which is the the name of our program course in January. So this will be the opportunity for people in addiction recovery and others. See, that's the thing. I don't want to limit because I don't, like you said, everybody deals with addiction. So it's not strictly institutionally people who are at recovery point or, or whatever, or in, you know, Narcotics Anonymous or Alcoholics Anonymous. It's people who are interested in the program for whatever reason, because anything that makes you feel good can be an addiction. And I, I think that the biggest addiction out there right now is the addiction to our minds and the addiction to our thoughts. Right. And so to get somebody's hands digging in the earth, and I believe that the power of the earth pulls you into a moment of presence, whether you realize you're there or not, and you will have moments of no thought. Yeah, you absolutely will. And that's funny because we we're cultivating that intentionally. So people in the program will have, it's a 200 hour long program and they'll have a hundred hours of working on the farm and, you know, just whatever that entails. So, you know, watering the plants on a daily basis, weeding things along those lines, they're really concrete things. But then we also have community weekends. So those people in the program will be managing these community weekends. And part of that is to break down the stigma surrounding addiction a lot of people in this community and all over the, you know, all over the country have this mentality that, <clears throat> that, you know, the, this dehumanizing sort of outlook uh, toward people in addiction recovery, but the community weekends and managing that side of it will be the opportunity for people to put a little professional and positive spin on, you know, the way they're interacting with the community. And then the other hundred hours is, job skills training, like when people leave their recovery program and need to reenter the world, they're going to be ready to do that. We're going to teach them how to network and do resume workshops and get them on the job training. These really concrete things 
and they'll be interfacing with our buyers on the farm. So, you know, we're going to be supplying local restaurants with food. They're going to be interacting with, with, you know, restaurant owners. Mm -hmm. And um, we have a, a local farmer's market here in town. So they'll be interacting with people at the Wild Ramp. It's really great. If you haven't checked out the Wild Ramp, you need okay. to. Oh, I think, I think we Marty have to because that, right? <laughs> we've been talked to about it and it's come up at least two or three times in articles that I've seen. Well, so there you go. I think we yes. got to go check that out. It's pretty great. I'm, I'm on the board I'm of directors listening. there. They're awesome. Oh, perfect. <laughs> yes, they're really great. Um, but they'll be interfacing, you know, with our buyers with and working on merchandising and administration and all of these really concrete job skills. And then... The final piece of it is Grow offers community yoga, meditation, and Tai Chi classes to the whole community because we do have that prevention mission as well. And I think that introducing new coping mechanisms makes it easier for us to fight this opioid epidemic. Huntington has an overdose rate that is three times higher than the national average. This is a problem. We have 21 overdoses a week on average in the city. This is a problem. Just last week, we had 26 overdoses in one night. This is a real issue in the city. And despite the fact that it is just astronomically devastating, I do not see it as something that is insurmountable. And I think that introducing new coping mechanisms and making them available and free is, is really a great way that we can do that. So yeah, we're going to be cultivating mindfulness into everything we do and then in this really intentional way leaving people with these skills to be able to to bring that into their lives on a daily basis the mindfulness piece is it's everything it really is it's everything because with drugs and alcohol and even just checking out in front of the television it's a way for us to divert our what's really at hand, right? Like what, what is really trying to have a voice within us and mindfulness by its nature requires us to, to feel and pay attention to it. So it's never about ignoring the thoughts or trying to stop the thoughts or anything like that. It's seeing them for what they are and, um, and questioning if they are true, you know, what is true. There's a quote that I, Reference often, it's from A Course in Miracles, which uh, I don't study, but this one quote just sticks with me all the time, and it's a huge tool for me. Every loving thought is true, and everything else, no matter the form it takes, is a cry for help and healing. Yeah. And then it goes on, and it says, like, would you turn you know, your brother away if he asked for help. And, and, um, and so I think that we can look at someone and say, oh, they're a jerk. They did this or that. That's a, that person is crying out to be more loving. And you can yourself, myself can look and judge other people, judge myself. That is a cry from within Yeah. to learn how to love more. We can look at people in recovery or people in jails, people who maybe have done things that we could never imagine forgiving. And then we can look in ourselves and say, have I been guilty of that in any form? Yeah. Murder. Have I been guilty of murder in any form? Yeah, I have. Absolutely. I've killed animal bugs inside. I mean, that is, it doesn't matter. It's not, no life is more important than the other. Right. No emanation of God is more important than the other. It just, it just is. I think what you're doing, like bringing the community together and creating a non-separateness to allow people to truly discover on their own timeline that we are all more similar than different. Right. And we just recently, last week, published a podcast with Gene Bauer, who's co-founder of Farm Sanctuary, who, um, living his purpose, create, has created this unbelievable place in upstate New York's for farm animals that never really had a plan. 
It just kind of came together, you know. And he talks about, he references this guy, uh, Ron Finley, who is, um, his website's The Gangsta Gardener, and he's in L.A., and he um, started planting gardens in that little space between the sidewalk and the curb, and L.A. said, no, you can't do that, and he fought them, and he won, and... Anyway, what I'm getting to is um, you're, we're li- you're living in a town, we're sitting in a town right now that struggles financially. And what this guy, the gangster gardener says, growing your own food is like printing your own money. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right? Yeah. It really, really is. And we sat down with Marty, who is the new uh, manager at Huntington's Kitchen yesterday. And it, it, he really brought us into this... Um, really where the work is. And it's not like, okay, you have to eat a plant-based diet. You've got to eat paleo. You've got to, it's like, whoa, let's get these folks from driving through the fast food line to get their meal. Let's get them cooking at home. So now you're going to have them growing food and sharing that food throughout the community. And then um, maybe working with them. Mm -hmm. He's got great plans over there to how do you prepare this food? Right. And now without some massive grant or, you know, um, financial windfall falling on the town, everybody is living on a higher vibration. Right. Because of what's coming out of the ground, because of the mindfulness that's going into it and the love and the healing. Like that food is going to be so nutritious. Right. It's going to be beautiful. Oh my gosh. And we're actually um, focusing, we'll be growing a lot of, a lot of crops, but we're actually focusing on growing herbs. Mm. And what I love about growing herbs is that the more you put them through, the better they are and the more medicinal they are. So, you know, you really have to coddle certain crops. You really, you know, you have to watch with, especially like tomatoes and, and peppers. They're so finicky, but I tell you lemon balm will, because you know, herbs were mostly wild weeds. And they, they're evolutionarily a lot further away from us, um, away from, you know, human evolution. So they've been on their own for a long time and they are a lot healthier when they've been through a little bit of hardship, when there's been drought or, or whatever, they're more medicinal. And I just think that that's such a great metaphor for, you know, what we're trying to do in Huntington as a town. Like you cannot keep us down because we're weird and funky and (laughs) entrepreneurial and awesome. And we care about this place and we're going to fight for it. It's persistence. You know, it sounds like those herbs, like we always talk about the food, but I never thought about that, about herbs and being, and we use a lot of, you know, essential oils. Mm. And I mean, it's a staple in the car. I mean, we're always putting it on. Um, But it's just that persistence of these, I guess, are they weeds? Um, basically, basically that, yeah. that just, they're persistent and they survive. Like, and have you ever tried to keep mint from like spreading throughout mm, your whole garden? Like mm-hmm. you can't, <laughs> it just goes, it, it just, just goes. goes. Yeah. And they they have so many healing properties. So just even handling these are, are going to, um, are going to be healing, but you actually make essential oils, don't you? Yes, do you, I do on a small scale, um, out of my own kitchen. Do you sell them? Oils. I have been selling a lot of um, soaps and, and like secondary value added products um, through my shop, Uphill Climb Botanics, uh, just on Etsy. Uh, so we make like anti-acne soap and, you know, uh, things along those lines. Um, awesome. Well, yeah. we'll link to that in the show notes so people can support cool. you. It's not and been something I've cultivated very much lately, but yeah, it's a piece of it. And now do you have like some main components of... Um, I see like you've yes. got something right there that I would love to yeah. love to kind of share. Yeah. Um, yeah, like the main components of the program. Right, absolutely. So the, the program is broken into two main programmatic pieces. The first half is the job skills program beginnings. So it has four components. Uh, human capital development, which is the job skills, the, the solid skills that people are going to be able to put on a resume and say, I did these things and I know how to do these things when they leave the program. Um, the nature assisted healing. So we're working actually with a med student out of Marshall University um, to develop um, a nature assisted healing research program. So we are going to be hooking the guys up to MRI machines and hopefully proving the nature assisted therapies are effective. This is crazy. This is amazing. Oh my god! This is gonna. That's a no. That's a no brainer. Right. It's gonna. It's gonna happen. That's so cool. I love it. Every recovery house has a garden. 
nearly every one. Because we have this intuitive sense that, oh my gosh, digging around in the dirt is good for you and makes you happier. <laughs> and grounds you in. And that's such a big thing with addiction is that we're not grounded into what's truly happening, right? We're doing right. everything to get away from that, anchoring into the truth of what it is. Right. And, and earth energy is that nurturing energy and it cultivates worthiness. And we also get the, um, like from the root chakra, like from right. our connection to the physical world, which is basically what, what is it? We get the steadfastness mm -hmm. that I'm going to stay with this. Right. I'm not going to have a drink today. I'm not going to have a cigarette this hour. Right. I'm not going to, you know, uh, buy the drugs. Like I'm not going to feed this negative thought. It's that steadfastness. And so connecting with the earth is so important. Yes. Oh my gosh, I can't even stress it enough. So important to feeling our feet yeah. in our rootedness. Right, absolutely. So yeah, so there's the nature-assisted side of it. And then there's increasing social capital. So we want, you know, often I, people people know this, when you leave a recovery program where you've... And it's, it's the same. I, I equate... The, the, especially the mentality of the guys at recovery point to being on retreat, like a meditation retreat or yoga retreat. Like eventually you have to reenter the world mm -hmm. and hopefully bring some of that with you. And you'll probably bring about 10% of it with you, right? Mm -hmm. And Ram Dass said, if you think you're enlightened, go to a family reunion, right? <laughs> <laughs> <It's> totally. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, in increasing their social capital, we want them to walk away with relationships and closeness that will carry them through this, this transitory time. Because often, you know, going back into the same old flow, the same old, you know, relationships and situations, housing is especially a part of this, um, you can reenter those bad habits very easily because that's the environment in which this all began, right? So that is another part of it. And then the final part of it, as I've mentioned before, is confronting that stigma of addiction. I am absolutely tired of people who have struggled with addiction being dehumanized. That makes me physically angry. Like, it's not okay. Because we all have these struggles. There have been times in my life very recently when my addiction has knocked me in the face and said, all right, you're at a crossroads. You can either choose this path or this path. And one of them might change your life forever. And I think that a lot of people go through that and maybe they don't realize that it's the case and maybe they just enter that path without, you know, without realizing it. Or maybe they, they live a healthier life and, and can circumnavigate those things more easily because of the situations that surround them. But ultimately, I think that it's something we all face. And, you know, reading the comment thread of any <laughs> news article, especially in Huntington, when it's about overdoses or our addiction problem it's very nasty and very ugly and we need to change that conversation right and I think that all of that is this cry out for help and I think that you are a shining bright beautiful divine light to come down and envelope that hardship and that suffering in love and you're using nature as the vehicle to really create a massive change within this environment. And I'm so honored to know you. Well, thank you so and much. And to sit across from you. And how can we help? <laughs> what, where are you? How can we help? Okay. So let's get down to brass tacks. Right. What do you need? Checks, how can you help donations? Grow, grow. Yes. <laughs> so right now, um, we do still have our GoFundMe campaign running. It is GoFundMe or wait, the, it is GoFund.me slash grow G R O Huntington. Uh, and you know, I welcome I welcome donations that way. That's been a really uh, incredible way. Um, we will once we have a promised donation coming in, but we will have reached our goal by the end of the month, which is really incredible. And I love that. And it's okay to exceed the goal. It is okay. Even if it's $5, $10, $2, you guys, if this is speaking to you, please, 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 we're going to put a link in the show notes to it. I think we're going to post it today on our Facebook because by the time this podcast goes up, it's going to be probably a couple months down the line. But sure. Yeah. And I'm going to leave it up because the beautiful thing about GoFundMe is they don't expire. I'm like, yeah, that's great. Yeah. It's a great tool. Um, 
So please, uh, if personal donations are your thing, please get involved that way. I think that that's a really beautiful way to get involved. And people really discount, um, like, oh, it's just five bucks. What can it do? But it does so, so much. Uh, we are also opening up our corporate campaign um, for corporate don corporate donations. That is also on our website, so you can check that out. Uh, we are going to be working really closely uh, with our corporate sponsors to promote them as companies that give back. Uh, I think that that's really important. And, you know, what I find, you know, this whole concept of, of uh, buying local, you know, local companies have a lot of buy-in locally and, and they're, they've been really wonderful for us. So, you know, you'll be able to, at a certain level, you know, sponsor a bed that we're working on or, you know, sponsor the farm as a whole. So that's a really great way to get involved as well. Uh, and please, you know, if, if getting involved financially isn't your thing and you're not in the Huntington area, please just get involved with us on social media. We have a thriving social media page because I'm a marketing professional. That's what I do. And that's where I live. Um, and I really want this to be an ever evolving thing. Grow hopes to be in five cities in the next five years. So we're probably staying pretty close to West Virginia because what I found was, you know, people in Seattle and Oakland started contacting me and I'm like, yeah, it'd be great to have grow farms out there. But as I've seen in my state in the last six months with devastating flooding and all of the, the problems that we're having with the opio opioid epidemic is that I am very much needed here. So we will probably be staying pretty close to, to West Virginia, but we hope to be in Charleston um, in the next year and a half. So yeah, uh, we are we are expanding. We are ever growing. So uh, please, you know, be a part of that and watch our process progress. So I want to leave everyone with one final question. Sure. Somebody who's out there and they're struggling with some kind of addiction, and, and again, it doesn't have to be drugs, alcohol. It could be shopping. It could be, um, you know, talking negatively to your spouse. It could be being consumed by your mind. It could be social media, social media. <laughs> it, yeah. It could be, you know, losing connection with people in person because you're so addicted to technology. What's your, what is one thing that could do to, to start bringing some, some truth and some shedding some light on what's happening within them without punishing themselves? The crux of what I'm doing with Grow is teaching people that everything you need to be your self-actualized self is right in front of you. There is no pill or, you know, item that you can buy that will be more powerful and more life-altering than looking within yourself and going outside. And, you know, if somebody is struggling with addiction in any capacity, the first thing that I would ask them to do is look within and figure out what you're not willing to tell yourself. What are you not willing to hear? And, you know, we find that with addictive behavior, it's that escapism. What are you running from? What do you need to navigate and what do you need to fix? what needs to be addressed, what internal conversation needs to be had. That's beautiful. And it's none of it is anything to be ashamed of or feel guilty because of. We are all beautiful emanations of God, of the universe, of higher intelligence, of whatever you believe is beyond this physical realm. We are all beautiful, perfect emanations of that love. And life itself is, we were just talking about this the other day, life itself is perfect. It's perfect. The life within you is perfect. It's looking at your life situation and knowing that every moment is a moment to begin again and that there is no forever in a sense of behavior pattern or negative self-talk or anything like that, that that every moment is a moment to find your purpose and live it fully. And you are doing just that. And you are an amazing emanation of this beautiful light that you're shining down on this town. And there's so much beauty here. I, I just, this is probably, 
one of the most touching experiences we've had are the two days that we've spent in this town. And I'm really, really grateful to be have been brought here. We weren't quite sure what was here. I really started to question it um, in the last couple of days. And it became so clear once we landed. And this is a beautiful place that I'm so grateful to bring awareness to and grow Huntington. Don't put any limits on that, girlfriend, because <laughs> I think it's going to be huge. So thank you so much. You had a super busy day and you came here to spend time with us to talk about Grow, um, something that you're doing for the good of all. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I thank you for being part of the magical Grow Flow. <laughs> I, I love, love the Grow Flow. I grow love flow. Grow Flow. I totally want everybody Hashtag should be. Grow Flow. Totally. Yeah. Uh, God, amazing. Thank you so much, Thank Jeannie. you. Just beautiful. Okay, episode 32 of the YTP with Grow's own Jeannie Harrison. Doesn't she just make you want to like get up and do something amazing for somebody else? I can't imagine what she's taken on, but I'm sure you picked up on the fact that this woman is not going to give up. And with the launch of Beginnings this January, I would say Grow is well on its way to impacting a city that needs this light of life. If you are inspired to support Grow, there are links in the show notes for you to make a donation. And if you want to check out Jeannie's Etsy store, I've got a link up for that as well. Her products are infused with her West Virginia folk wisdom and earth-friendly ingredients. Sounds good to me. If you like the show, please let us know, you guys. It helps so much every time you shoot us a quick message or comment on a post or even better yet, what really helps the most is leaving a review on iTunes. I know you're busy. I'm busy too. I have a list of reviews that I need to write up, but what I can tell you is that when I take the time to give back and let the world know about my experience with that person or product or podcast, I always feel a little lighter in my shoes. And my ego loves it. It gives me a nice little pat on the back because I'm doing something for someone else. So I'll leave you guys with this. Inspiration stays inspiration until we put it into action. Thanks again for checking out the show today. We'll be back next week and wish you all high vibes for your life.